welcome to this podcast. Today I have my best friend, Douglas Joseph Smith. It, it took us like two tries to do this because we we're just so silly and it's, it's hard. Like <laughs> cracked up a bit. But to introduce you to the audience, you are a very interesting person. The day I met you, what'd you say? To say the least. Day at least, yeah. <laughs> like the day I met you, I was an orientation leader. I was waiting for my team, uh, my group to come in. Mm-hmm. And you were the first one. You had your long hair. You walked in all nice looking. I was like, my good brother, how are you doing? It's like, good. And then I tossed you the ball that I had for the group. And they were just tossing back and forth. And I just, from there, I was like, this kid's going to be like a very close friend of mine. And then look at you. Uh, I remember that day. You asked me what, what was my favorite song or what song you wanted to play for me. Yeah. And then I said, Red Hot Chili Peppers, Can't Stop. That is such a great song. Such a great song. <laughs> but yeah, like, that, that's, that was my first, like, just moment with you. And that's a lifetime moment. But like getting to know you, I started realizing that you're, you reach to deep levels in your mind. I think it's important that we can actually, you know, touch upon our minds as people. I think that what's missing from our culture, our civilization itself right now, and I, I'm sure that other civilizations that existed before this modern time was they really were in touch, in touch with their I'd say their mental mind. They were really in touch with it because they didn't have the phones to keep them distracted. They didn't have the internet to keep them distracted. They didn't have work excessively to keep them distracted. But year, uh, but but a year we have that to distract us. But year, guess what we have now? We have people who are starting to notice that this is distracting us and it's causing us anxiety. So therefore. We start reaching into a deep, deep part of ourselves. And that deep part is the mind, right? So for you, I noticed that you're very, you reach into your mind. You're a big solitude dude. I want to ask you one single question at the moment. Okay. Solitude. Why do you think it's important? Because you, you do retreat a lot. You do go on walks by yourselves, by yourself, and you... You just sit by the river and just listen and just think. I want to know why you do that. I think it's more of like a safety place. Like for some people, it's more of like a safety place. It allows you to like, it allows you to replenish yourself in some form of way. It allows you to gather your energy. Like for me, when I go on a walk, it's like so relaxing. I'm able to see all the different details, like the growing grass, the sun shining on my face. Like for a period in my life, I didn't get to experience that. Like if you want, we can go into more detail on that. But yeah. for about like two months of my life, all I experienced was play until darkness or not much sunlight, not much of the outside. Mm-hmm. So when I go outside, take a walk or when I talk with friends, I'm really able to enjoy that. So I just really enjoy being by myself. Like, watching God's creation. Yeah. And like to further like go into that, it's just telling the audience, you're not, you're not like just a full on introvert. Like you enjoy conversation with people. Like you really do. We can go on talking for three hours straight and you're not faded at all. That's, that's something. But I think the fact that you, you know how to retreat and how to go find your solitude because we kind of have to go find our solitude. Some people's solitude is not actually being alone, right? Like it's, it's a weird thing that I, I found out later and like later as I grew up, it was, it was my solitude is actually not me being alone. Right. I'm going to further explain that before later in this episode, but yeah, I don't know. I don't know. But like the thing about you is, the way we could engage in a conversation and then 
like you would go in your solitude. But as you said, it was to replenish yourself. It was a recharge, right? Do you think it's because of your personality or do you think it's because you found out some sort of truth to the universe and you've been using that sort of, I guess, tool, if you want to call it? Would you call retreatment and that old seeking solitude as a tool to engage with the world? It could be in some sort of sense, but I also view it as some kind of communication with God, mm. like that alone time. You need it to, when you're by yourself, you're able to be more in tune with God. When you're with other people, you're able to sharpen each other and your relationship with God. Yeah. But when you're by yourself, you feel him on a more personal level. You need that kind of solitude to like grow as a person. Yeah. When you're with, what were you going to say? Now, I was going to ask you the time that you were, you faced that sort of darkness in life, that two months that you mentioned. Mm -hmm. Were you, what was different? Because that two months, were you alone that two months? Or was it like a painful two months? As in like it was darkness, as in like there was tragedy in life. But like you, you experienced, you know, your solitude, but you still experienced talking to other people. Like was all that going on, but that darkness was just basically like a, like a real like cloud of dark. So for that two months, I was in the hospital. Like there were people by my side, but my brain mentally, I couldn't really talk to them. It was like I was in a funk of some kind. And so what I had was seizures. So it was a type of focal seizure. So I would stare off into space mm -hmm. and I was like put in a trance. And so that happened on and on until it got to be like every minute I was experiencing seizure. Yeah. Then eventually I was put in the hospital and for two months I was basically in the hospital. And I didn't really, I couldn't really talk to anyone. I was not really dead, but I had lack of communication with any outside friends, basically with family as well. Even though they were right beside me, I couldn't have that normal conversation with them. But then I guess one day, I guess this is like a spiritual, spiritual moment in my life. My aunt came over and she asked, she asked me if I had any visitors. And I said, yeah. My mom was in the room and she was like, he didn't have any visitors today. My aunt, she was like, shh, be quiet, Maria. <laughs> so my aunt continued asking me, so this visitor, what do you look like? I said, an old man with a white beard and a little beanie cap. So after she, after she was done questioning me, she showed me a little picture. Now, if any of you know who Padre Pio is, that's what this old man looked like. And so he came down and he prayed with me and we both prayed to God. And after that day, I started to get better. Mm -hmm. After the doctors put me on a medication, I started to get better and I was able to get out of the hospital in the next few days. And I was able to basically live a normal life. And so after that, I enjoy like private moments that I have with God because now I'm able to experience him in a new way that I'd never had before. Yeah. Like, I'm not in that spiritual darkness that I once was. This experience that you had, how important is it in the future of your life? Like, is that the experience of your life? You know, like I feel like everyone, there is one singular experience that makes who they are that it could be a, it could, like, I wouldn't say it like necessary has to be like, when I say experience, it could yeah. be a f like a, you just actually like imagine something or you, you have a thought or it could be so, uh, like an event. It could be anything, but that experience that took place for two, that two months and the conclusion of that two months, do you think is helped you shape yourself? 
pretty much. You could call that <clears throat> a defining moment in my life. But there are so many more experiences that are yet to come. So yeah, yeah. So but definitely, yeah. That definitely. is definitely a important factor in your life. Yes. Describe. Okay, I'll go into this part first. You write poems a lot. Like your Instagram is filled. It's a colossal. It's a it's a museum of poems from your mind that you created yourself, right? And just to create something like that is actually pretty difficult. And people should understand when someone creates something, it could just be a drawing. It takes some so much to do. There's so much going on just to do something like that. But writing a poem, that it's a it's it's a structure that you kind of follow, a structure, and then you kind of have to have a some sort of inspiration, some sort of topic that you're going into. You can't just you know write crap, you know, right? You write something that's you write something that's an embodiment of what your mind is trying to portray. So for you. There's, you touch upon a lot of spiritual topics, but there's a topic that I, I'm very interested in, and it's grace when it comes to God. What does grace mean to you? I, I've seen in your poems time to time. What is grace to you? I feel like, <clears throat> excuse me. <laughs> excuse I feel me. Like it's, yes. Excuse me. <laughs> I feel like it's almost like giving a part of yourself to someone. And I think of mercy when I think of grace. Like, I'm sorry, give me a moment. I need to recollect my thoughts. Oh, yeah. Take your time, buddy. Yes. Well, I, I, would, I would say grace is very... Uh, very, it's a very interesting thing because that's talking about Christians here. We see that nothing can beat uh, Jesus' grace, God's grace. No one, nothing can beat it because it's something we don't deserve, really. Yeah, it's a, it's a gift. It's a gift, but it's, it's not even a normal gift because mm -hmm. if you really think about it, strangers does, don't gift people things mm -hmm. you kind of there's there's a relationship with a gift on this hearth like you know you see you see a friend uh you know you a friend you give did, did you give a gift to a stranger before well you could have but how often do you do it it's never all right but with christ it's a weird notion that for him is grace is for the world but there's also another thing I saw, I just thought about, there's an introduction of a relationship after this grace. And sometimes even before, like the acceptance of Jesus in your heart, the acceptance of the fact that he died for your sins. Grace is introduced. And then we have, you know, the, uh, in theology, we have stuff like repentance, like that's also very necessary. But I think the grace of Christ really comes from acknowledging. And then after the acknowledgement, you have the relationship. But here on earth, we tend to have relationship first, then gifts, because I'm not spending money on you. And then, you know, look forward to a relationship with you. But yeah. Jesus Christ... Well, he is Jesus Christ, you know? So, like, tell me more about this whole grace phenomenon, too. I find it really strange because we don't really develop that relationship with God until I feel like we have that breaking point in our lives, until we break down, until we really understand our weaknesses. Like, we're in that dark moment of our lives then we look out towards God because I think it says in the Bible, when we're in our darkest moments, when we're in our weakest moments, God, we just, we feel God, God is strongest in our lives. Mm. 
And so I think that's when the change begins. We look to God. Sometimes it could be the opposite. Sometimes for some people, they might begin to break down even more. But for some people, they begin to look towards God and their relationship grows stronger and it's solid. Mm. Then they become a Christian. So you like what just with just this topic itself, because this topic can get a little bit like in that emotional part. Yeah. Like, tr when tragedy strikes, okay. First of all, I believe the meaning of life. I, I believe that life, there would not be a life on this earth without suffering. Yeah. Right. There would not be life without suffering, but suffering exists. And therefore you have to put a meaning to that suffering. But a lot of us do not. It's hard to put meaning to a suffering, especially one that's active, you know, mm -hmm. like mom gets cancer today. You're angry. You're sad. You're just. There's so much going on in your feelings, in your mind, that you don't know what to do. And then someone comes up to you, you got to find a me uh, meaning to your life. You just, no, get out of here. You know, that sort of thing. So I, I found it quite interesting that God is really high up there when suffering is high up there. Why? Because I do know a lot of Atheists have found God during their worst times of their life, but never find God during the best time of their life. Do you think there's some sort of problems that go on when we're too happy, when we're too joyful, that could lead us a, a, away from God? Yeah, because if we look at the Israelites in the Bible, <laughs> <laughs> Ooh. it's like a complete cycle. Like when they're being captured or tormented by their captors, they cry out to God, like, God, please come save us, please. God swoops in, he brings in a prophet, and they're like, oh, thank you, God, we'll praise you for the rest of our lives. Mm -hmm. Ten years later, they're like, they're praising other idols, yeah, hurting people, and God brings in another, like, kingdom. Plague. A plague. And the Israelites... It's like whenever we're too, too happy, we're, we're happy when we idolize the world, the different things in the world, Yeah, we forget about God. I think you just said a parable about this, or somewhere in the Bible, it says something about serving two masters. You can't serve money, and you can't serve God at the same time. Because if you focus on one more than the other, you won't forget about the other master. Yeah. I think that's what's like for us. Like, we begin, once we begin to um, focus our relationship on God mm -hmm. and we become happy with things he's done with us, we're like, yes, thank you, God, so much. But then a thought in our head kind of spirals out of control. We become too happy on the things that he's given us. Like, with the different materialistic things. And we're like, oh, wow. I love this so much. We kind of worship the things more than yeah. the creator who made them for us. And then we forget about God. And we spiral down in life, spiral down in life. And we're like, where is God when we need him? Where is he? And he's been there with us the whole entire time. Then we go back to God. And it's the same cycle. It's the same cycle because we're worshiping the things that God has given us instead of God himself. Hmm. Because we're worshiping, we're trying to worship two masters at the same time, but instead we're worshiping the one evil master instead of the one true master. Because that one evil master would give pleasure. Like pleasure that makes us feel alive, you know? Yeah. The pleasure that sneaks in and keeps us, like is, if you see, if, if you could go back and listen to what you just said, there's a lot of times you said, forgot, forget, 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 forget. That pleasure keeps us forgetting. And it's problematic because we, we want to be happy. You want to feel joy. We need it. Like there's, it's, it's tough. But the thing is, we believe that 
We deserve to be happy our li- in our lives. But we should understand from momentary happiness to happiness for for a very long time because people were too happy. You see, there is so much. I don't really care, you know. You're too you're too chill, you know. That's that certain sense. And I, I think it's a problem because suffering puts you on the. It keeps you looking. It keeps you there. It's like, watch, be careful. You know, don't do that, because remember what what you did left uh, made you you know go in this area, but happiness, you're too chill. Eh, whatever, eh, whatever. Everything is so it's so blissful, and you for, as you said, the Israelites will just literally forget that the fact that they have all these things, all this food, is because of God that provided it, and. They just chill out for so long. They don't even praise God. They probably forgot to praise God and forgot to pray unto God. And what happens? God brings them a plague because God is worthy of praises, right? But it's so easy to forget. Why is it so easy for us to forget? Why is it so easy to forget? Basically, due to what we I said earlier, well, basically due to our human nature, I think because we're so focused on the things of this world and not the things of God, I think that's why we forget so easily. So we're focusing on the the things God created, and not the Creator. Yes. But, like, I don't know. It's weird, though. Like, why are we so easy? Like, why do we forget so easily? Well, it could be a couple different things. Maybe memory problems. <laughs> memory problems. Some people, get, some people get bumped into the head a little too hard. Makes them forget. The whole human race was just, like, <laughs> bumped in the head. And that was it. Like, boom. You know, or, like... <laughs> So should we just give God that? Should we give God that like, excuse? Be like, yeah, we were all just, you know, we we're all just in the head by, you know, an asteroid one day, and then it went through our genome, and it, it was like an epigenetic, and then it turns to a genetic, like straight up, and we all forget. <laughs> What'd you say? Can we just give him that excuse? <laughs> It's, I think it's weird. I think it's, it's very weird that, like, we all just straight up forget so much. And not things that happened, like, 20 years ago. Like, legit, we forget things that happened, like, a day ago. And I'm not just talking about, like, forget. Like, I'm talking about things that affected us. Like, it's insane. And there's Israelites. They're not, they're, <laughs> if you compare them with our society, they probably get like a A plus. Like, look at them. get like an F minus. Yeah. Like, I'm, I'm quite concerned, in my opinion. Like, I don't know. But I have a question about consciousness. Yes. Do you think... Okay, so you have people that believe like the pineal gland is like the root to the soul, right? It's our soul. Rene Descartes says the pineal gland, the pineal gland is like the soul of the man, right? Why is there so much concern with just the soul, consciousness, the spirit? Why is it, is it because there is a in this world, no matter how much we try to shun it away or scientists try to say it doesn't exist, do you think that 
we unconsciously, you know, are trying to express express the unexpressible in our lives. That spiritual thing, because there's so much spiritual dogma. There's so much spiritual talks going on and it's never been suppressed. No matter how much religion, uh, how, how much um, scientists like disprove this and that. No, we can't, like, there's no way you can shut down the whole unconscious trying to come, come in. Like, it's weird. It's like, we always have something new. We always say like, but like, you know, this and that and that, like, can you explain that to me? Like, I think you probably understand this more than me. Like, why, why does that happen? Why is there a always continual movement to some sort of spiritual thing? Well, I guess because our lives revolve around the soul. Well, technically, we're the soul itself. Me speaking right now, it's not my flesh. It's my soul that's talking. Mm. Our two souls are communicating between each other. And there's constantly like a battle between like the spiritual, like there's a war that's going on constantly between like angels and demons. Yeah. That's what I think. And because of that, that's why so many things revolve around spiritual matters. Because if you look back at Daniel, mm. I forget which chapter, I think it was chapter seven. I could be wrong. It's one of the chapters in there, later chapters. Daniel was praying, I think for 20 days straight. And at the end of these 20 days, after he was done fasting and everything, he, I think an angel came to him. And because if he hadn't have fasted and prayed for the, that 20 days, his angel wouldn't have made, like, wouldn't have been able to fight against one of the demons that he was fighting against within that amount of time. So I think what we do here affects the spiritual world as well. Mm. So that's so, why that. So you think that the reason why, no matter like how much scientific we get, we will always have some sort of spiritual conversation is because like the spiritual itself first of all exists and second of all the spiritual itself kind of needs us to keep the conversation going in a certain sense because picture a society without any spiritual context society where it's fully secular how do you think the people will be like i think those people will be full of anxiety. Those people will be full of stress. And they will look to a certain Edenistic way of life to fulfill a sort of emptiness that can only be filled by spiritualism, by some sort of... When I say spiritualism, I, I mean... Because I'm not talking about this old, you know, hippie movement. I'm talking about stuff like, because the, like, to be spiritual, you kind of need the Holy Spirit. That's what I'm trying to say. I'm not talking about like a hippie movement. I'm talking about a, a faith, right? I think that sort of society sort of kind of exists, don't you think? Well, if we're talking about like back then, I'm, I think of Sodom and Gomorrah. Without any, without, without any spiritual context. Because, because they had no spirituality with it. Because no one worshipped God. Yeah. There was just sinners. Like, I mean, there, there are sinners everywhere now. Days. I mean, everyone's a sinner. Mm -hmm. Back then, it was just total evil going on in that city. Everyone wanted to do evil constantly. Evil was running through their constant every second of every single day. Mm. Everyone wanted to hurt each other. Remember when the two angels walked into the city? The people 
gathered to them instantly and wanted to do evil things to them. But Lot said, back off, they're my two guests. Mm -hmm. And then they were just so evil that God just wiped them right out. Yeah. Um, hellfire or... Yeah, fire from heaven. I think it was hellfire from the angels. Yeah. Yeah, with that, like, it brings another interesting thing. I always add... God came down. There were there were three people that came down, right? Mm -hmm. And they met with Abraham, right? First of all, what's weird about it is the fact that God made a decision to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. Yes, he ended up destroying Sodom and Gomorrah. But the thing is, Abraham, the father of faith, right? Here's, here's the problem I have with modern day Christians, right? I, and it's not a problem I have with the individuals who are modern day Christians. I, it's a problem I have with a certain trait of belief, I would say, right? And Abraham contends with God. He's like, no, 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 no. What if you found 20 people there? Are you going to destroy them? 20 good people there. And Jesus said, I, I said, Jesus. And God said, okay, angel, go search. Not 20 people were found. What about 10 people? Not 10 people were found. It's like, can I at least save Lot <laughs> in his family? And God said, yes. Like, here's the thing we forget. We can have an active conversation with God. But the thing is, why... Okay, like I'm going to go into Israel. Like, you know, I love talking about Israel, especially. Yeah. Like, Abraham, the father of faith, he is the father of faith. He's a faithful man. So God can, God can take his words. He, like, for us, we can be like, oh, I'm going to yell at God. I'm going to contend with God. Well, how close are you with God, though? You know, that sort of thing. Like, Abraham sort of had a hierarchy with like, no matter what, Abraham's still a servant of God, right? But he had an hierarchy. God, God can calm down and talk to him, right, in a certain form. We never said, man, well, people, like, you never say, said, like, came down, like, in flesh. They just said three individuals came down and were, were represented as God. And that also raised another mystery, three. You know, our Bible is so significant with three. Was it God the Father, Holy Spirit, and Jesus Christ, the Son? Like, that sort of thing, right? So, I'm just very interested in knowing, what do you think about the contending with God? Do you, like, a lot of people don't believe you're supposed to contend with God. Like, actually, like, negotiate with God. And we saw it. We see this many times in the Bible. Like, what do you think about that? So I think of the different prophets that came down later in the line. Like, um, I think Jer I think Jeremiah also like talked with God a lot, but he yelled at him kind of in his prayers. But also, was it Isaiah as well? Well, some of the prophets, they like to like talk with God, but they kind of yelled at him. One more than the others. I, it was either Jeremiah or Isaiah. I forget. I think Jeremiah. Can't remember. Anyway. <laughs> I think contending, I like the idea of it because it allows you to be your honest, open self with God. Mm -hmm. You kind of show him your raw emotion, but in a sense, you can't do it too much. Yeah. Like, there was a point, I was in Bible class. I haven't read the whole of Jeremiah, but at one point, God was like, okay, you need to calm down a little bit, Jeremiah. And Jeremiah didn't. He didn't yell at God anymore after that point, like in that moment. But later down the line, he did yell at him a little bit more because he was ex because he, he was feeling exhausted. He was feeling angry at his circumstances. Yeah. So he had to yell at God. So we as humans, we need to express our emotions in some sort of sense, whether it's crying, crying or yelling. 
and God is there. He's always there to talk with you. And so we need to cry at him, yell at him, be angry with him. I love how you said, like, it's an expression of raw emotion, right? Mm-hmm. There's certain tests that God gives in this world and in the Bible to test if this person's going to do it in love, too. Like, I remember how, and like, Jesus talks about how if something's not done in love, it's well, no, I think. I think Jesus said something across the line of that, but like the, the disciples, when they wrote the Gospels, they wrote something about that. Mm-hmm. About if it's not done in love, I think Paul wrote something about that. If it's not done in love, it's useless, it's worthless. Like it's important that everything, every action, even if God said, go destroy that city, go destroy that city, call upon angel, destroy. Let's say God said, hypothetically. If you just said, okay, I'm going to do it. God is going to see you as an obedient as an obedient servant. But what if that's not why he was tested? What if he was seeing, where is, where is the love that my son has taught you? Why couldn't you say that what if there were people that were striving for my heart that why couldn't you talk to me more? That sort of thing. I feel like God, we put God in this part where like, you could see the difference between people who find God in like a relationship way and people will find God in more of a hands down religious way. You know, I see a difference. Like you, I would, I would speculate based on how I know you. You find God in a very relationship way. And I think it's still building over time because I see how you act with love, right? I see that this, this might be wrong. I see at times you'll be able to defend someone and it would not be the right defense fully. It wouldn't be the good defense, right? But it will be a defense in love. And I could see you shunning yourself from different activities because of the fact that it's not right. But putting yourself in some activities, although it might not be right, but it's in love for something. I, that's the sort of thing. Like it's, Those type of Christians would treat like that, right? Exceed this platform of just, you know, they, it, they care a lot. You can, you can feel it when they walk by you, right? It's a difference between a, like, it's a difference between like a, a lion, like a, a, like a male lion and a female lion. It's weird. Uh, I read a story. Well, I didn't read a story. I was watching a podcast actually of this guy talking about that. It's just like there's you get like you get a certain feeling when a male lion walks next to you and a female lion walks next to you. It's it's super weird, and I, I still don't understand it. But that's what I can put together as. I don't know. There's, I think with love it's important. I think like Devin, I had on. I asked him, what wish would you wish to the world and said to just feel love? And we agreed on the fact that it's love is what's missing in this world. You can follow any rule, but the thing is when people start shoving other, their, people start shoving faith down other people's throat without care, without, because they could assume that it's because they care about the other person. But do you understand the sort of, pain the person goes through? Have you first tried to talk to them, be their friend, before you start acting them with a faith? It's not going to work at all. Not at all. So, I don't know, like, with love, it's just so, like, love, I should just have a specific series of, like, love and just be like, hey, listen, it's a tough thing to encounter. Love with Christ is different from the love you give to other people like it's so different 
because the love of the love, love of Christ is so perfect, and our love is so imperfect. But that's why it makes it such a humanly love. It's rough. It's 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 rugged, you know. But with contending, I want to go back to this part where we have Israel. God comes down. It was Jacob, right? Uh, God comes down. God, the creator of heaven and earth, universe, he comes down and wrestles Jacob. Right? I find that so amazing, yeah. And that, that's not even the coolest thing. Jacob wants. Right? But how did he win? Jacob didn't win by, like, you know, somersaulting God, be like, ha ha, boom, I hit you with the Holy Spirit. Like, he didn't do that. <laughs> so, you know how, so, you know how we wrestle, like, maybe like five minutes at a time? Yeah, yeah. Sometimes I mean, at night. So fun. Dude, that's, my heart rate's like 170 and puts you down. <laughs> yeah. Well, Jacob, he wrestles God, not just for, a couple of minutes, not for an hour, not two, two hours. He wrestles for him for all, like the whole entire day, like 12 hours. At one point, Jacob, a couple hours in, God takes his hand, just his hand. And he touches Jacob's side. And Jacob has, what is it, a broken rib, broken hip? I think it's broken hip, yeah. A broken hip. Jacob, he, he should have been down for the count. He should have been down like, oh, I'm so tired, so exhausted. But he kept going. He kept going for those couple of hours. Mm -hmm. Kept going after God. And I was like, okay. What what did he fight him for? What was he wrestling him for? Was it for Rachel, his wife, for to claim the land? I forget exactly what it was. I called. actually can't remember why it was wrestling. Because I, I was going to say, the reason in the end why Jacob won was Jacob demanded something from God. And God gave him and therefore declared him the winner. Was it his blessing or something? I can't remember. Man. Like, talk to me about the fact of this contending. That old day of contending with God. How does that work? Like, it's insane, isn't it? Yeah. I wish this was like Joe Rogan experience, and I would be like, "Hey, look that up for me." <laughs> <laughs> hey, you over there? Look this up for me. Come on, make snappy. Yeah, it's insane. Demand. I'm. I'm gonna look it up. Yeah. Demand. That's God. I think that really solidified his relationship with God. Like wrestling him. Like that whole entire day. He he demanded a blessing. Blessing. Yeah. What was a blessing? So people Let's just put points down. Jacob did not initiate this wrestling. God did. At first, Jacob did not know who he was, uh, did not know that he was even wrestling with God. God touched Jacob's hip, cripples him. A devastating blow, right? Jacob was wrestling in his own strength. That's insane, right? Yeah. Jacob asked for a blessing after he stops wrestling, after God cripples him, after he recognized the man was, uh, the man he was wrestling as supernatural. The asking for a blessing does not sound like a demand. Jacob was, Jacob was weeping. Oh, uh, Jacob was weeping when he asked. Jacob came to the end of his own self-sufficiency. 
Jacob received his blessing only after he stopped wrestling with God and come to the end of his own self-sufficiency only after he sees God's face and recognize God as God. That's interesting though. Because he only received that blessing after the he, he ended the contendant with God. Right? It's in, I, I find that interesting because maybe we do have to contend with God to a certain point. And then after that contendment, oh, that contending with God, right? We come to this, we'll know when we're done. Because technically God will win, first of all. Because God is, right? We, he will win. But the thing that's different about this win is you learn. And he technically with you learns. Because I do believe... Although God knows all, that relationship we have towards God, he learns with it too. Because the pain and sorrow that you're feeling as, as, as Jacob was wrestling God, the pain and sorrow and that, that just him demanding as it just, it just said that he was weeping as he demanded this from God. Jacob definitely learned at that moment of something. And God, not, I don't want to, I think I'm using the wrong word when I say learn, that God didn't learn, but more of like felt. Like God had to, we can't just say God was just like, do, 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 like, no. Yeah. There is, there is some strength to it. There is definitely some strength to it. Like, it's insane, man. I think the Bible is just quite like the Bible is so cool. It's such a cool book. I think more people should read it, like to just like see how interesting it is. Like if you're not even reading it as a as a as a believer, just read read it as just you're reading a book. But like you'll start getting hit with like, wow, this is so different. This is bad supernatural. Like what happens when you contend with God? What happens when you, you know, do the John Cena on God? You have your hip broken. Because God just places his hand like on your hip. <laughs> oh, but no, man. Like God said something after he dem uh, Jacob demanded something. I wish I can find it, though. Um, something afterwards? Yeah. Um, he said something to him. God sets so proud. It's interesting. Was he in a dream? No. Because I found a ver verse in um, Genesis 35. Wait, wait, wait. You could s read that to me. I don't see the exact verse it's just like popped up on here can't really see it it just says genesis 35 it says god said to him your name is jacob but you will no longer be called jacob your name will be israel yes that's the part yeah so he named him israel and god said to him i am god almighty be fruitful and increase in number a nation and a community of nations will come from you and kings will come from your body. Hmm. Jeez. That's verse, that's chapter 35 of Genesis, verse 10 to 11. I just love that part that says, I think it's, it's quite remarkable. It says, let me go for the day is breaking. But Jacob said, I will not let you go until you bless me. See, for you to do that, you can't be an atheist. No, you can't be a, a push. You can't be a distant believer. But also, this might be a little bit controversial. But you also, 
it's not a certain ideology or belief. You just have to recognize God. Like, this shows us that Jacob, rest, thinking he's wrestling just another person, realizes the person he was wrestling was not normal. Second of all, it was supernatural. And third of all, this person was God, is God, I mean. So we just have this whole, I don't know, it's, it's quite remarkable to me, the fact that Jacob wrestled God. Like, should I be like, should we be scared of Jacob? Like, I have this story of Matthew McConaughey, and it's quite cool. Matthew McConaughey is, a great, is a, such a cool person. But as he does, as he, as he does, he, was, he went to Africa. And, like, when he goes to travel, like, he acts like he just he takes up a different name and everything. And he went to this village, so no one can recognize him. He goes to, like, this very... I don't even think it's a village in Africa. You went, I think it was like in Indonesia or something, Mali or something. And like, no one knows him there. And like, he's there with his friend and like, they were just in this village. He lives there for a while. And like, it takes a, it takes a, like, he has to create a whole different life for himself. He does. And he, he chose as a, you know, I'm a wrestler, right? Uh, my, my name is this and that. And, but he didn't do his reachers very well. That village he went to is, is a village that's known for, like that village, the, the the popular people there are the wrestlers. So as Matthew, he doesn't wrestle. But everyone, because he's like foreigner, everyone's like, he's probably the best wrestler here. So he has this individual come in. Uh, they, they, first of all, they one of the best wrestlers there like taunted him like, I want to go after you. A brawl. Right. They have a wrestling match. Matthew Muscane actually wrestled that man. Actually wrestled the man. I can't remember quite. I can't, I can't quite remember if it was a man or a woman, actually. Because the name was a little bit feminine. Um, but it was quite it was quite the story. You should go listen to the story. And it has such a weird loop to it, too. But he wrestled, he won. And it's just like, whoa. Like, yeah. Yeah. He said he, he was roughed up, though. Like, badly. Because he wasn't expecting this trip to, you know, go seek the universe was going to end up in, like, wrestling. But one of the best wrestlers there, he, he, the person was very quiet. He saw him. And all he did, he took Matthew McConaughey's, uh, McConaughey's hand. He just held his hand and walked him like 10 miles to, the, uh, to where he, Matthew was trying to go. He left him there, bowed, and left. Then when Matthew came back one day, like a few years later, he saw the same person, the person, he, which was the, he was like the declarated wrestler of that community, grabbed his hand again and walked him tens of miles. Like, if we think we see cool things on the internet, no. Travel, you'll see cool things, right? But, like, that, that's like a hiatus of a conversation, though. <laughs> but, yeah, like, either way, like, God, man, there's so many things that we could talk about. But, like, later in this uh, podcast, just this channel itself, we're going to have sections called... I actually don't really know what's going to be called. Probably like stories of stories of old, letters of old, something like that. And it's going to be a couple of guys and DJ sitting down talking about God and the philosophical meaning to it and everything. Because I believe that people can find God through many different outlets. You can find God. Some people, and it's not one size fit for all. No, it doesn't work like that. Some people, for them to, to feel a certain way of God is through apologetics. Some people, through the rigorous, rigorous training of like the, the theology, just that's it. Some people, it could just be a life event that brings them close to God, such as you, right? That's important. But 
You know, a cool thing I always wondered, though. There's so, something happens when you travel the world. When you actually travel, I'm not saying you, you know, you go to the Bahamas and you like go chill on a damn beach. You know, I'm talking about you travel the world, different communities, different villages, and everything. You experience different people. You talk to people. You don't isolate yourself. You go to the, you go like to the village bar and have conversation with individuals with stories like you never heard of, right? Stories you have never and will never read, right? Why does that sort of change someone's outlook on life? Like you've heard of people like traveling different uh, places and then like they're like a different person after. Why do you think traveling kind of changes you? I guess because it offers a new like perspective on life. Like at that moment, like, if you're just this person, let's take me for example. I've only been in Delaware and Philadelphia. Let's say I've only been in Delaware so far. Yeah. Delaware is like a very small state. When people when people say Delaware, they're like, Delaware? But where's Delaware? <laughs> so I'm only this small person. I only see a few things. When somebody like comes from abroad and like tells these different stories to me, I'm just like, wow. That's so cool. It gives you new things to look forward to in life. It makes you want to travel to those different places. Yeah. And to see the different things in creation. It also it might be a stretch, but it speaks to your soul. Not a stretch. Yeah. It speaks to your soul. I think your soul yearns for those different experiences. And makes you like closer to God through those different experiences, like seeing different people's cultures, getting closer to them and developing relationships with them. Like I always think you can see God through different people. So seeing different people of different cultures, you're getting closer to God. Yeah. Talking with them. I I 100% love what you just said, dude. Like it's an, it changes your perspective so much. Like there's actually like scientific stuff done and we, we found out that it's basically like when you are in just one place or just one area, you kind of see the world through that area and that's it. Like, okay, like not to go into politics or anything, but like privilege, right? We have privileges. In America, as Americans, no matter what color you are, you are American, right? You have the American privilege, right? But we talk about country, like there's literally 600, 700 million people without water, without clean water. Their water is full of cholera, different diseases and illnesses, right? That they can get. But in America, and a lot, and especially the people who haven't traveled around different countries. Uh, to different countries they they believe that like the big the big issues going on here is are the big issues ever but people in different countries don't even have the necessities the basic necessities and they're happier than us it's so weird like matthew mcconaughey traveled and he saw that these people like Sometimes I haven't promised they're gonna have a dinner that night. But what's in their face? They're they're like all you see their teeth all day long. You know what that means? They're always smiling. Always smiling. Why is that? And you figure out it's because of the fact that they are just they have something to look forward to. Constantly. Constantly. They have good relationships, good friends. People care. Not because of what they have, but because of who they are. Not with their material things. It's just like, how important that is that to you? Just traveling. Like, how important is traveling to you? 
Are you gonna is is that part of your bucket list to travel to parts of the world? Yes, one day I would like to travel to Iceland, like with you, you and John. I know we all want to go there someday. Heck yeah, that's gonna be amazing. Yes, it's gonna be great. You know, it's funny. I saw a video on TikTok of everyone. <laughs> It was hilarious. I'm kind of quite scared of it. It was like, everyone think Iceland is this. And it showed like a bunch of pictures of like, you know, how we, you know, when we look up Iceland, we're like, whoa, it's so pretty. Nicely. Right. And her, uh, she posted a pic, a video of after like her friends and them went there. It's just, it was all windy. Like the <laughs> car got stuck in the middle of the snow. Like it was such a terrifying, but they had a good time. But she's just like cold, 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 cold. I was like, ooh, I hope we we had a time it correctly and kind of go in their kind of summer in a certain sense. Although it's still really up north, but I think it's more north than Canada, right? I think so, yeah. Uh, it might it might be. Uh, insane. I guess, I guess we'll have a fun time up there. Yeah. You know what you know another fun time we need to have? Maybe encounters with the UFOs and stuff. UFOs, yes. Yeah. Like, dude, this is kind of one of the big reasons why I I thought the podcast was what should happen now. There is so much weird things going on. Like, yes, there's crazy stuff going on in this country and in this world, but the phenomenon of UFOs have grown exponentially where you have declarated fighter pilots right you have you have like SOs I mean COs like chief officers swearing that they seen something they cannot explain you have paintings from the 1800 1800s depicting UFOs what is going on? Like, wh- d- first of all, you're a religious man. Do you believe that there is extraterrestrials existing in this in our, in our universe? Do you believe that there's other life on other planets or asteroids, stars, anything? Please don't hate me, people out there, but... I don't think so. You don't think so? Like, even though the universe is, like, That's... beyond the scope of our imagination, like, I don't believe in them. Like, they're real, because I feel like they would have made contacts, like, real contact. Yeah. Like, they would have started making negotiations, for peace treaties. They would have started, they would be in our society already. They'd be like, hello, human. How are you? It's something um, like that. Oh, were you? Okay. Let's start with this. There's something called the Fermi paradox, right? They're named after Enrico Fer- oh, for on me. Oh, Fermi. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah? Fermi yeah. paradox states the reason why aliens have not made contact with us is because of the fact that the universe it's, is expanding for, like, exponentially, just forever. Mm-hmm. Right? It's still in that stage of, like, it still has that, same momentum that it has from the beginning right right if we're talking about the big bang that expansion is still taking place right it's forever expanding but there's a cool thing the galaxies too uh, the galaxies are still also moving away and apart from each other but these are part of this this movement is light years right so if aliens do exist Fermi paradox states the reason why they can't reach us and we haven't reached us yet is because of the fact that it's there's expansion going on and the more it, the expansion goes on, the less technology they have to meet us to reach us. Right? That's one theory. Another theory states that they're already here. They've been here. Who do you think built the pyramids? They're disguised among us as humans. I don't have a thing that disguised among us as uh, humans. Like you have, not even stories, you have literally depictions 
from the Aztecs, from the Mayans of different fins, weird, weird figures, right? Mm -hmm. Like legit, they like come down from the heavens, right? Egyptian, Egyptian talks about, talked about this too. And you're like, this is weird. Have they really been in our society? And some people actually, there's a book written by this uh, person who works in the NSA or the CIA, I can remember. And he's been working there for 70 something years. They say he's this tall, albino looking man. Tall, as he's like tall, right? No one has ever seen him aged. And he works very top secret level. A book has been written about him. And he called, he, he's, this is all air say, by the way, but people, but people said that he has said that he's from Venus, that they actually live underground, underground Venus. And they've been helping out the humans, taking, giving them, you know, common sense on why not to destroy their earth with nuclear, you know, weapons and everything, helping them in no negotiation between different countries, right? What if humans have already infiltrated our world and they're actually helping us? Do you think that would actually fuck up some people's faith? Like tomorrow, literally, they show themselves. There's a big flying saucer in the air. And we're just like, whoa. And they were like, we have existed before you, right? Yeah. We have been helping you guys since your ascension. We've been there. We've been in your, we've infiltrated every society you have ever created. Do you think it will affect other people's faith in God? I think so, yeah. Because... <clears throat> Here's a brand new thing, like, oh, not brand new, but here comes aliens, like a long time awaited thing where like, some people believe they're myths, some people they don't, don't believe they're real, but some people believe they are real. Mm -hmm. And the people who believe they are real, or some people who believe they are myths, they see them coming in, they're like, oh, wow, oh my gosh, they are real. They'll rush over to them. People who didn't believe they're real, they'll be shocked out of their minds. They'll be like, People, the Bible never mentioned any aliens, did they? They'll look through the Bible and they'll be like, no, I don't think so. That They might distrust the Bible a little bit. Yeah. They'll go rushing over to the aliens. They'll, they might even technically worship them as gods, in a sense. And they'll go run to, the, to them. They'll start following their every move, every action, because that's kind of what they expected from like the Messiah back in the days. They, they wanted to like, follow his every move and action once they saw him, right? Yeah. So when they see these aliens, they'll kind of treat them like the Messiah. They, they won't they, they won't really be the Messiah, but they'll treat treat the aliens like the Messiah. Okay. So it'll kind of mess up how they believe in Jesus and everything. How weird would it be if they say they actually know who Christ is? And how weird would it be if they say we know this person you speak of and he actually is the creator of heaven and earth and all that exist. What would happen then? I think that'd be like really, really cool. Like there was this book I read. It was like a Christian fiction book. And I, I know you're not really into fiction books, but <laughs> it was back in, um, my English class in high school. I saw it out of the corner of my eye. I thought I'd read it. So it was about like actual aliens coming down. Like this one guy, it, it was like the only real alien in the book, but he revealed himself to be an alien. Everyone started crowding towards him. Mm -hmm. Like he had a presence that just drew everyone in. But this one girl, she, she didn't feel anything about him. She couldn't like tell why everyone was so attracted towards him. Like wanted to be around him and worship him. Yeah. So, like, everyone like, crowded around him, 
And then one person mentioned Jesus Christ. And he was like, he stopped for a second. But then he said, oh, Je Jesus Christ, um, something, something, something. But towards the end of the book, the alien was actually like a demon. And someone else, like one of the girl's close friends, was actually one of these aliens, but she was actually an angel. And she got rid of the demon and uh, so on, so on. But yeah, there's there's theories beyond that stuff too, like how they some people actually believe that if aliens do exist, extraterrestrials do exist, that they actually because the Bible has speaks of things called the giants, but a translation, Nephilims, right? Mm -hmm. And there are the offsprings of the fallen angels. Mm -hmm. The fallen angels came down to earth and intertwined with intermingled you know, with the daughter of men, which created the Nephilims. This was before the flood. My thing is, did they survive the flood? Like me and you and John have been reading stuff about uh, the book. We've been reading the book of uh, book of Enoch, yeah. and we're not finished with it, but. It has very interesting stuff about this Nephilim situation, right? But the the Book of Enoch and Book of Enoch itself, it it literally says this book is for the end of the end days. This book is not for because Enoch actually knew there was going to be a Bible created. He said this book is for the end days. Was that in one of the first chapters? I think, uh, like, I didn't read it in there. I, I saw an excerpt somewhere on the internet, and I was like, well, well, if I'm reading it right now, I'll read the end days. Actually, that's one of my pet peeves. I hate when people are like, this is the end of the world. This is when Christ is going to come. I'm like, stop it. Stop it. Every single, every single generation has believe that this was the end Th that was done the, what's going on right now dude world war one on no one have ever seen such thin they thought it was the end and also they call the war to end all wars right and then we had world war ii killed double the amount of people that we killed in um world war one so my thing is just like If aliens were real, would they, do you think they would be good? Well, do you think they will be predominantly good or predominantly evil? Based on how you know humans. I think they'd be like us. They'd be like us. In, in a sort of sense. And if they were technologically advanced, they would have to be hyper us then. Super evil. Loki. Because mm -hmm. you have to look at us human beings. We are quite spectacularly evil, but we have so much potential for good. Yeah. That's the weird thing. Like, if someone says you, uh, human beings are not innately evil, that that's that's the funniest thing to me. Let's take a look at kids itself. I understand part parts of their brain are not funct uh, they're not fully developed yet. Actually, a lot of part of our brain is not fully developed till we're twenty five. But even an adult temper, right? A lot of things can make us evil. But why a lot of things go wrong in our body, and we automatically go for something that just anger or sadness or just something with a negative connotation why 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 does that happen in my story like it just it like it just seems that our the goal to just achieve something good something something positive is always the hardest thing to reach but to achieve anything negative with darkness or with, with just sadness and anything it's it's quite easy to achieve 
Like if someone said, I'm going to set out on an expedition to find unhappiness, darkness, sadness, they'll find it in like five seconds. Yeah. But if someone said, I'm going to go on an expedition to find love, true love, to go find just pure happiness, all this, they might never actually find it. So why is why is there so much darkness in the world? It's weird. You know what I'm reminded of when you said darkness? Hmm. I look at it real quick. You know John one? John Wayne? No, uh, the first chapter of John. Oh, okay, okay, yeah. Here's what it says. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shineth in darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. So, let's see. I must give a couple verses. Uh, there was a man sent from God whose name was John. The same came for a witness, to bear witness of the light that all men through him might believe. He was not that light, but was sent to bear witness of that light. That was the true light, which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. Yeah. He was in the world, and the world was made by him. And the world knew him not. He came unto his own, and his own received him not. The reason why that is, I think it's because we're so used to the world. Like, we're so used to the things of this world. Yeah. Like what I was bringing up earlier, we're so attracted to the creation, not the creator. We'd rather be in the darkness and try it towards the light. So we don't want to be with God. We'd rather just be. I think it's. It, it's hard on us. We know the way. To go. At least the people. Okay. Just. People who haven't heard about Christ, they still have some sort of belief in something. Why do we always like to find meaning? We try to look up, look at the stars, the universe. Because as you said with the aliens, like people are trying to worship them, put them as the Christ too. It's because us as human beings, although we try to rebel, so much rebellion, we always want to have something to serve too. Right? There's that, there's that, it's just in there. We need some sort of master. And people are like, oh no, no, I don't need a master. But yes, you do. You want a master and you need one. You're literally biologically made to want, need one. Because look, you don't, you don't, you don't need a master? Okay. You don't want a master? Okay. How about that money? about that alcohol? Oh, that weed? About anything that plagues our society. Even our phones. They're masters. Because in the end, the tools use us. Not us using the tools. Because right now, like you do pretty well with not using your phone much. But if someone told you you have to give up your phone forever, would you be able to? If I'd actually have to throw it away. <laughs> like if, it, if it's like right here next to me and someone told me, give up your phone, I, I can say, okay. Yeah. Next, five, next five minutes, I'll be like, oh, I wonder what all my friends are doing. <laughs> like for no, real, though. I'd have to throw it away to actually give it up. Mm-hmm. I couldn't give it up with it right next to me. These like tech companies of like just made 
psychological incisions in our minds and made us so reliant on this phone, on these technologies that they're not even tools anymore. They're like an organ. Like, if you're missing it, you feel like <laughs> there's something missing, actually. Yeah. You know, it's weird. It's weird. Like, it, people, like, actually find the love of their life, and, like, they lose the love of, of their life. They feel like it's a part of them is gone. Imagine with that extent, with a phone. How, how terrible would that sound? Like, they should make an episode one day, and someone's just like, like, it, it's out of context. Someone's explaining how much they missed this thin, this person. And the end, we just, it, it turns out to be phone addiction. And we already, like, gave so much, like, this thing, it was always with me. It was there when I was, when I was sad. It was there when I was happy. It was there to provide. Like, we, we've fallen deep. There's good music in the background. It's like, hey, I'm going to lower you. But turns out, you know, phone addiction or drug addiction or just, and all these addictions starts with, motiv uh, with motivation. It starts with a pleasure center, the dopamine. Modern day has destroyed dopamine, literally. Dopamine is used for the pleasure, but it's also used for motivation. Right? That's, it, it works like that. So our brains literally want what gives well, our brain that when we do something that releases high amounts of dopamine, our, our brain works to get it again. That's why drug addicts keep using. That's why phone addicts keep using as we all are. We keep using, we will find an excuse to use our phones. And also physically they have created an excuse every excuse to use our phone. Like you can't have a job now without a phone. But oh, let me, let me, let me use my landline. But you're gonna have to post this on this. You're gonna have to use LinkedIn in this. Uh, but like it's, it's actually detrimental to not have a phone now. And it's terrible. Because we're just on phones right now. In 30 years, what's gonna happen? Like think about the fact that like in 1904, 1906, the Wright brothers created the first airplane. And then 66 years later, what happened? We put a man on the moon. Right? All these phones, all these like, you know, YouTube, all this stuff, right? They really popped up in like 2007, 2008. 2007, 2008. It's 2020 right now. Um, the rate, it's exponential. So it's gonna, it's just gonna, at first it starts gradually slow, slow, slow. That's how it works. And then it spikes up, it's like a virus. At first one person, two people, and then two people spread it to two other people. And then two, those four people spread it to, it just grows. That's how the rate of technology is gonna grow. So now what we're gonna have in like 10 years from now. Flying cars. What'd you, what'd you say? Flying cars. Flying cars. But I think there's going to be something created that's going to be more detrimental than the phone. Something that they don't even want it in our hands anymore. It becomes our identity. Something linked into us. That's what I believe. And I'm saying right now, I don't ever want to get that sort of thing. But I have a feeling we're going to be forced to. Not even by governments, by society. Society always out of a way. Like, yes, the church of oh, the church of God is the church of God, but it's also ran by human. Who says the government can't pay off these people? Anything is possible on this earth. So it's it's quite tough the way we're going. Also, with all the terrible shit that goes on, there's great things that are going on, too. People creating companies in the hopes of doing better for others.
selflessness is increasing too, right? Because the news doesn't tell you everything that goes on in this world. Only what they want to tell you. They only tell you what they want to tell you. But man, if you put your, if it's where you keep your mind, because your mind is the power of everything. Your, your mind is the power of what you believe about God and your relationship with God. Your mind is the power of how you feel today and your mind is the power of how you're going to feel tomorrow. Your mind is the power of time. If you're having great, if you're having a really fun time, the time will go faster. It's been proven. If you're having a, if anxiety and stress slows down time feels like you're there for eternity but you're actually just time is relative but the mental the mental mind that 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 mental mind is insane plays games man like it's insane but ufos i don't know man we're gonna do like this covid relief bill that was just signed has a 180 day disclosure for UFO. And that's why it includes in there. This that COVID relief bill was just full of so many weird stuff. Like the reincarnation of the Dalai Lama. Yeah. Look that up. That was in there. The reincarnation of the Dalai Lama. They gave um, like literally, it just talks, it has like five pages about the Dalai Lama and what has to happen for him to reincarnate. Why is this in our COVID relief bill? Right. That's the problem. But 180 day to closure for UFOs. And by that 180 day, the Pentagon's going to release everything it knows about that UFO. Maybe about at that time we'll figure out that we're not actually alone. Because the rates of like sightings have been increasing. And not by, you know, just some wacko from like Nebraska, but from government agencies that are seeing all this shit take place. You're just like, oh, okay, it's getting weird. It's getting absolutely weird. Ridiculous. Are they ready to show themselves? And if they do. It's going to change this world. And you know what I was thinking one day? The two witnesses. Imagine these aliens come down. Just two, two individuals come down first. You know, the Bible's weird now. Yeah, it really is. We might have an idea of like, oh, this is out. This is going to happen. But it, it happens in a very different way, like the Antichrist. We think we're going to know the Antichrist when the Antichrist comes. No, bullshit. We're not going to know. It's going to lead us astray so hard. Like, it literally says it. The most are going to be led astray. On the very left. And I pray that every one of you listening, a part of the elect, is it's important <laughs> that's that it's a i i said this to dj today i said that i believe the antichrist will well the antichrist will manipulate people but it will manipulate people with their feelings that's what's going to happen because the best way to have power over someone is to know how to play with their with their feelings their anger, their sadness, their needs. It's going to happen. I don't know when it's going to happen. I don't like saying, like, this is the end of the world. Because that puts more anxiety on me. So I don't say it. I'm just like, yo, shit's not, shit's not right right now. <laughs> it's not. But, hey, I, I wasn't there to experience 1914. I wasn't there to experience 1946. I'm here to, I'm, I, I've experienced 2000 to 2020. And I know, I only know what happened for real, for real, 2000, 2020. So 
you know? These two witnesses, if they show themselves and <laughs> turns out they were actually aliens. <laughs> What do you think about the two witnesses? Like, do you think it'll be two completely new people or two people from like the Old Testament? I think, I, I, I wanna say, I'm just gonna say what I think. I believe that it's gonna be two people from the Old Testament. The two people that didn't die, but also the problem of the two people I picked that believed are going to be the one coming. Mm -hmm. One of them technically died because Elijah is one of the person I want to say. Well, Elijah and Enoch, first of all. Enoch, no one, he never died and it's still clarified. Elijah, John the Baptist, Baptist. Yeah. Didn't he claim he was Elijah? Well, I don't think he claimed he was he himself was Elijah. I remember it said he claimed himself as one speaking like a voice speaking in the wilderness. Other people said he was the second Elijah. Because I don't know if they knew what happened to Elijah or not, but they just thought he was the second Elijah because of the way he dressed or how he spoke. Don't know which. Because Elijah was literally told God, hey, buddy, I need to be taken up in a chariot. Like, he was taken up in a chariot to heaven. And as God has proclaimed, all will die. Right? So, I think it will be those two. And it makes sense for those two to come. Because if you read the book of Enoch, Enoch is not a normal one. Enoch lives 365 years on earth and was no more. That's how the, the verse went. Was no more. And it's, because if you, it's all about patterns with the Bible. And I, I want to see the real translation of like the actual original text from, from it, how it was written. But like the other... Others like was saying like, and they died at this, and they died at this, but it was like he was no more. And the Book of Enoch it showed the truth about Enoch. So he became an interceder. Uh, he interceded uh, for <laughs> with God and the angels. fallen angels. Fallen angels. Like we haven't done with this, so like there could be more. But yeah, it's like, I don't know. It's quite something. But all I know is we just have to be watchful of what goes on in our world. Right? Do you think so? Like, yeah. that's a clear statement right there. Just be watchful of the things that go on in your world. Don't try to assume things because, you know, as you're my math teacher used to say that makes it ass of you and me but the truth is be watchful be knowledgeable know your history and don't forget it and follow god and or follow the belief system that you have make sure it's whole in you not just half or one fourth make sure it's whole because a man who does not have something to believe in falls for everything. You don't want to be one that falls for every single thing in life. It's, that's just the truth. So, you have anything else to say, DJ? God, is there anything I should say? What's up, Father? Uh, anything else? I don't think so. No. Hey. This was awesome. Very deep. I loved it. Just loved it. This is the sort of conversations I really love having. Enjoy this conversation. Yeah. It feels like I was just playing chess. <laughs> In my head. Did you know like chess players like fuck like they checked and 
Do you know that game of chess? Like those world renowned chess players, they they lose or like how do I say it? They lose like five thousand calories just by sitting there playing chess. And they, they hooked them up to like a brain scan and it shows that their brain is on fire. Got stuck into chess. Yeah. But also, it, it can be shown for people who do, like, deep thinkers and are having, like, conversation where they have to, like, think and piece things together. Mm-hmm. Like, sitting here, I could have lost calories. Well, I do lose calories. You have the basal uh, metabolic system, but, like... 5,000 calories? Huh? Did I lose 5,000 calories just sitting here? Bro. Talking with you? 5,000? That's for chumps. We just lost, like, 10,000. You know what we just did? 15,000. 15, 15,000. Um, that's a lot of food to eat tonight. I got my potatoes, my ground beef, and everything else. Ice cream, cake. <laughs> well, if you're trying to do a muffin, is like 900 calories right there. It's crazy. But, dude, thanks for coming, man. Thanks for inviting me. Oh, yeah. I love you, and I always enjoy talking to you, and you will be back. Uh, so thank you man you have a good day you too